Now, Count Godfrey crossed about this time too, with more counts and an army of 10,000 horsemen and 70,000 foot, and on reaching the capital he quartered his army near the Propontis, and it reached from the bridge nearest to the monastery of Cosmidium right up to the church of St. Phocas. But when the Emperor urged him to cross the Straits of the Propontis, he let one day pass after another, and postponed doing so on one pretext after another. The truth was that he was awaiting the arrival of Bohemund and the rest of the Counts. For although Peter on his part undertook this great journey originally only to worship at the Holy Sepulchre, yet the rest of the Counts, and especially Bohemund, who cherished an old grudge against the Emperor, were seeking an opportunity of taking their vengeance on him for that brilliant victory he had gained over Bohemund when he engaged in battle with him at Larissa. The other counts agreed to Bohemund's plan, and in their dreams of capturing the capital had come to the same decision, that while in appearance making the journey to Jerusalem, in reality, their object was to dethrone the Emperor and to capture the capital. But the Emperor, aware of their rascality from previous experience, sent an order by letter that the auxiliary forces with their officers should move from Athera to Phileas, a seaside town on the Euxine, and station themselves there by squadrons, and watch whether any messenger came from Godfrey to Bohemond and the other counts behind. Or contrawise one from them to him, and if so, to prevent their passage. But in the meantime, the following incident occurred. The Emperor invited some of the Counts with Godfrey in order to advise them to suggest to Godfrey to take the oath, and as time was wasted owing to the long-winded talkativeness of the Latins, a false rumour reached the others that the Counts had been thrown into prison by the Emperor. Immediately, numerous regiments moved on Byzantium, and to begin with, they demolished the palace near the so-called Silver Lake. They also made an attack on the walls of Byzantium. Not with siege engines, indeed, as they had none, but trusting in their numbers, they actually had the impudence to try to set fire to the gate below the palace, which is so close to the chapel built long ago by one of the emperors to the memory of Nicholas, the greatest saint in the hierarchy. Now, it was not only the promiscuous mob of Byzantines, who were utterly cowardly and unused to war, that wailed and howled when they saw the Latin troops, and beat their breasts not knowing what to do for fear, but the loyal adherents of the Emperor, recalling that Friday on which the city was taken, were alarmed lest on this day vengeance might be taken on them for their former actions. All who had military knowledge rushed helter-skelter to the palace, but the Emperor did not trouble to arm himself, did not even put on his corslet of scale armour, nor take shield or spear in hand, nor gird on his sword, but sat firmly on his throne, and with cheerful countenance encouraged and inspired confidence in them all, while deliberating with his kinsmen and generals about the action to take. To begin with, he insisted that not a single person should go out of the city to fight the Latins. Firstly, because of the sacredness of that day, for it was the Friday of the greatest and holiest week, the day on which our Saviour suffered an ignominious death for us all, and secondly, because he wanted to avoid civil strife. So he sent frequent messengers to persuade the Latins to desist from their undertaking. Reverence, he said, the God who was slain for us all today, who for the sake of our salvation refused neither the cross, nor the nails, nor the lance, things fit only for malefactors. But if you really desire war, we shall be ready for you the day after our Lord's resurrection. Not only did the Latins not obey him, but they even placed their troops more closely and sent such heavy showers of darts that one of the men standing by the emperor's throne was hit in the chest. Seeing this, most of those who were standing on either side of the emperor proceeded to draw back. But he sat on unmoved, consoling, 
and gently chiding them in a way. This demeanour filled all with amazement. However, when he saw that the Latins approached the walls quite shamelessly and would not listen to sensible advice, he sent first for his son-in-law, Nicephorus, my Caesar. Him he ordered to take stout soldiers, skilled archers, and station them on the top of the wall and added the command that they should shoot plenty of arrows at the Latins without taking aim, but should rather miss so as to terrify them by the frequency of the darts, but by no means to kill. For, as I said above, he respected the sanctity of the day and did not wish for civil war. Then he bade others of the nobles, most of whom carried bows and others wielding long lances to throw open the gate of St. Romanus and make a display of violent assault upon them. They were to draw themselves up in this order. Each of the spear bearers was guarded by two peltasts on either side. Then, in this order, they were to proceed at a slow pace, but send a few skilled archers ahead to shoot at the Franks from a distance, and to keep turning about from one side to another. And as soon as they saw only a narrow space left between the armies, they were to give the orders to the archers accompanying them to direct a shower of arrows at the horses, not the riders, and to dash at full speed against the Latins partly to break the violence of the Franks' onrush by wounding the horses so that they could not ride against the Romans, and secondly, which was more important, to prevent any Christians being killed. The nobles joyfully fulfilled the emperor's bidding, threw open the gates, and now galloping at full speed against the enemy, and now checking the horses, they killed many of them while only a few of their own party were wounded on this day. I leave them to their perdition. My lord, the Caesar, took, as I have said, the experienced archers and stood on the towers shooting at the barbarians, and all aimed well and shot far, for all these young men were as skilled as the Homeric Teusa in the use of the bow. But the Caesar's bow was in very deed the bow of Apollo, and he did not, after the manner of the Homeric Greeks, draw the string to his breast and place the arrow and fit it to the bow, exhibiting like them the art of the hunter, but like a second Heracles, he discharged deadly arrows from immortal bows, and provided he willed it, he never missed the mark at which he aimed. For, on other occasions, during the time of strife and battle, he invariably hit whatever object he proposed himself, and whatever part of a man he aimed at, that part exactly he always struck. With such strength he stretched his bow, and with such swiftness he sent his arrows that in archery he appeared to excel even Teusa himself and the two Ajaxes. But although he was so skilful, he respected the sanctity of the day and took the emperor's injunction to heart. And when he saw the Latins recklessly approaching the walls while protecting themselves with shield and helmet, he did indeed stretch his bow and fix the arrow to the string, but purposely shot without aim, launching them sometimes short of the foe and sometimes beyond. Even though on that day he only pretended to aim properly at the Latins, yet if a reckless and impudent Latin not only aimed several arrows at them up above, but also seemed to be shouting out insults in his own tongue, then the Caesar did indeed stretch his bow at him. And the arrow did not leap from his hand in vain, but pierced through the long shield and corslet of mail, and pinned the man's arm to his side. And he, as says the poet, at once lay on the ground, speechless. And the cry went up to heaven, of our men congratulating the Caesar, and of the Latins lamenting over the fallen. As our cavalry were fighting bravely outside, and our men on the walls equally so, a serious and severe battle was kindled between the two armies. Finally, the emperor threw in his own troops and drove the Latins into a headlong flight. On the following day, Ubus went and advised Godfrey to yield to the emperor's wish, unless he wanted to have a second experience of the latter's military skill and to swear that he would keep good faith with him. But Godfrey reprimanded him severely and said, 
You who come from your own country, as a king with great wealth and the great army, you have brought yourself down from that high position to the rank of a slave. And then, just as if you had won some great success, you come and advise me to do the same? The other replied, We ought to have remained in our own countries and not have interfered in foreign affairs. But as we have come as far as this, where we sorely need the Emperor's protection, matters will not turn out well for us if we do not fall in with his wishes. But since Godfrey sent Ubus away without his having effected anything, and the Emperor received news that the Counts coming after were already near, he sent a selected few of the generals with their troops and enjoined them again to advise, nay, even to compel Godfrey to cross the straits. Directly, the Latins caught sight of them, without waiting even a minute or asking what they wanted, they betook themselves to battle and fighting. A severe battle arose between them in which many fell on either side. As the Imperial troops fought very bravely, the Latins turned their backs. In consequence, Godfrey shortly afterwards yielded to the Emperor's wish. He went to the Emperor and swore the oath which was required of him. Namely, that whatever towns, countries, or forts he managed to take which had formerly belonged to the Roman Empire, he would deliver up to the governor expressly sent by the emperor for this purpose. After he had taken this oath and received a large sum of money, he was invited to the emperor's hearth and table and feasted luxuriously, and afterwards crossed the straits and encamped near Pelicanus.